that. Okay, now I'm starting the recording. My uh, webinar hosting provider doesn't allow me to create uh, very high resolution recordings of uh, these webinars, so I am recording this separately. So any questions that you do ask, um, people will probably be able to see uh, during uh, the webinar uh, on the replay on the YouTube channel. So just a FYI uh, on that. But I really appreciate everybody joining uh, this month for, uh, now that I'm recording, the 2017 March uh, 3D Printing 3D Design webinar. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Honeypoint 3D is doing absolutely awesome. We're about to announce a very, very large partnership to offer our design services uh, throughout the United States, uh, 65 maybe locations. So look forward to that uh, in the upcoming month. And we generally focus here in Honeypoint 3D on two sides of the whole 3D printing and 3D modeling ecosystem, all with one point. We want to help create 3D models for people. I, uh, Nick, am in charge of the educational division. I teach classes, I record classes for people to purchase uh, online on our website. I do individual consulting, all sorts of things around education uh, as I am a very technical kind of type person. The other co-founder of Honeypoint 3D has skills that I completely lack uh, and that is Lisa. And Lisa is uh, the business development, marketing, project management, kind of the, the outward facing person. Um, very, very talented. She's also my wife uh, and she handles the rapid prototyping side of the house. So all of our client work where people hire us to create models for them. You can either learn from me uh, through education to create your own models, or you can hire us and we will create models for you. Uh, with that said, this week we will, or this month, we'll be talking about uh, Mesh Mixer. I got some questions on that that I'm looking over here, uh, and some questions on Fusion 360, as well as some things that I wanted to bring up with Fusion 360 as well. Again, if you have any questions at all I uh, live on the webinar, I invite you to uh, type them in and I will be very, very happy to answer them as best I can. Uh, let me go into some of the things, or actually just one of the things that I wanted to bring up first, uh, which was one of my own topics about branching designs inside of Fusion 360. Fusion 360 is constantly evolving. If you watched last month's webinar, there's some very, very cool things about sheet metal that are coming out that allow you to fold and twist sheet metal, then flatten it all out, make your changes, and then it all refolds, uh, things like that. But one thing that I've discovered in the past month is really, really useful. It doesn't require any specialized skills, and now that I have really started to learn it, it really impacts how I do business, especially when working with uh, clients. So let me show you that. I want to uh, bring you into Fusion. So let me screen share like this. You'll see yourself go into infinity here. And I will uh, bring up Fusion 360. Let me actually properly size this so everybody can see it. And I just closed Fusion. Let me restart it in a second here. What the branching designs does as we see Fusion 360 restarting in the background here, which it should now uh, be restarting, is it allows you to explore design variations very, very efficiently. If you're working with customers and you a customer asks a question about uh, changing the size of an object, but they don't really know if they want that size or not, this tool allows you to uh, to do that. So let me show you here. This, let me resize it just so you can see the whole screen here. This is done only at the project level. So you see right here I have one design called a branching test or ridge right here. You don't really see a whole much and if you don't see this at all you have to open up the data panel right here by clicking on the nine grids. This is saying that this is the master branch. You might not have seen this or you might not have paid much attention to it, but it's really, really cool. This is a master branch. We don't have any other branches right now. 
you, there's a couple things inside of here. You say uh, either create branch or you can go down and click on this and say create branch. I'm just gonna say create branch like this. Uh, it's a branch from the master, which is the only one that we have, and the branch name web in our test branch. And we say create. What that does is it copies the entire project. You'll see now that this was green, it's now red, and we have uh, what we had before, essentially branch test orig. But I'm gonna rename this branch test, I'm gonna say branched, something like that. So I'm gonna rename that file, and I'm gonna go in and open this up. You can see I'm in the kind of the red one right here. And this is important because as I open this up, I see that there's a little red circle up here because I am in this red branch. I created a cool little shape like this using uh, some of the patch environment, some things like that. And it has the whole history down here. So I can go in and change whatever I want to change with this. In this case, I uh, use the patch command to uh, kind of extrude this out or and scale it up and then loft back. We can make a change here to the scale command. So I'm gonna double click on that and say, I'm gonna make this a uniform scale, maybe, uh, maybe go smaller. This might break some fillets and things like that later. But now this is smaller. It's very, very much different. And the customer might, uh, might have asked for a little design variation on this. We say great, and I'm gonna close this and save it. It saves inside of here. Now, if we click on this little down arrow right here, actually, I'm gonna let this save in the background. If we click in the down arrow, we can say view project history. It brings up a menu. It says we started with our uh, branching demo project created, so that's the main project. And then we created what's called a test branch right here, which broke off a red line a branch created, and we created this essentially branch right here. We can click on any one of these and see a little bit more information about the changes made in each of these branches. And we can go and show customers different designs. We can do a, you know, share public links for this. If I want to go back, I can click on this kind of triangle right here and say, I wanna go back to the master branch. You see now I am in the green. I could actually open up the, the master one, click on the triangle, go back into this branch and open the test branch. And you can see at the top here, I have a green circle and a red circle. So it shows me which branch I am working in right now. Let's say that we like this red one. The customer says, I want this. You can cl click up here and say pull or push. So you can merge this to another branch, essentially push it into another branch. It doesn't have to be the master. I only have one branch right now. Or I can pull from another one into this one. So if I say push, it'll screen that pops up and says we have a webinar test branch to the master. What's gonna happen is the branch test branched which is uh, in the webinar test branch, the result is the branch test orig will be renamed to the branch test branch and updated in the master. Because this, you can kind of think of these as, as columns. If I had a whole bunch of changes, this is the master column going down here. This is the webinar test branch going down here. In this case, if I click, you know, this is already clicked. I am pushing this branch test to the master. I could click this one right here and essentially um, I'm not doing any change in the master because I'm pushing nothing. I'm going from here to master, I'm not pushing anything. Uh, if I kept this clicked right this, uh, then this would become the master branch. But let me show you the other way. You can also pull. So if you say pull, merge to this branch, what it's gonna do is say it's um, from the master to the webinar test branch. We would say there's no real changes on the master since the last merge because the master was not changed. So there's no need to do this because there was no change from the master to this. This to the master did have a change. So that's why we do this. So let's do that. 
let's push merge to another branch from the webinar test branch to the master and we're going to say merge comes back we still have these two we will look at the project history right here there we go you see that we created a branch we liked what happened we pushed the uh, test branch back in to the main line and the main line is the one that survived right up here you can see that the webinar test branch um, it still is a valid branch you don't really get rid of branches but the main one is the one that is now surviving up here and you can go and do more changes on the master and create more branches if you want this is very very powerful uh, and I started to use this quite a bit and now you see we're in the master as I open this up the master now has the smaller top the other one was much bigger and popped out here the master now has this one and I'm free to go and create more branches if I want there's also something called milestones you can use which uh, allow you to actually merge things in I would uh, suggest that you go in and look at the documentation on branching and merging to uh, really kind of show what uh, to, to learn what this does let me go back to here and Click on that. Now you should be able to see me. Great. Very quick description on branching and merging, but very, very useful. Something that now that I started using it, I use it actually all the time uh, when I want to make some big change, uh, when it's just show clients, or even just for my own knowledge to maybe test out if I am, you know, modeling something like this. Uh, I didn't model this, I downloaded this from Thingiverse, but I could, you know, just a little pencil holder, I could go in and make a design variation where uh, some of these cylinders are a little bit wider or a little bit thinner, and then go and print it out or do whatever, and then the one that I like best survives. It makes it so you don't have to kind of go back and forth in designs a lot when you're making big decisions. So pretty cool. Let me uh, get to some of the questions that were asked and we'll deal with those. And I haven't received any questions yet on the webinar, so I will, I will deal with these. Let me go into this one right here. Okay, so this is a, a question from uh, Bill. Uh, Bill asked, and I'm doing these in chronological order, so I'm not picking and choosing. These are all the ones that, that came in first. I'll answer first. This is a question uh, on a few different things. Uh, about 3D sketching in Fusion and sculpting forms and um, has Mesh Mixer been EOL'd? I'll answer those uh, kind of in a reverse way. Mesh Mixer has not been end of life by Autodesk. If you look uh, on the Mesh Mixer website, it's still there. They're planning on coming out with a new version sometime. Uh, they've been broadcasting that for a couple months now, but I think they're working on some bug fixes. Mesh Mixer is kind of a weird thing. It's been part of the Autodesk portfolio, and but it's not part of Fusion 360 or um, Inventor, like the big banner products. It kind of sits down underneath. Totally an Autodesk product, but doesn't kind of rise to the level where Autodesk believes that it's going to make money off of it. Except that they use that essentially as technology, as tech the underlying aspects of Mesh Mixer are being used in all over. You see it in Remake, Autodesk Remake, which is the photogrammetry solution. You see it getting into the Mesh workspace inside of Fusion. All of the code that was created for Mesh Mixer is working its way into other places that deal with meshes. It's not end of life by any means. There is still no tool inside of Autodesk or really outside of Autodesk that does what it does, but um, it does have kind of a weird place in the Autodesk portfolio, but it still is a place. It's not, it's not going anywhere as far as I know. I really hope that doesn't because it's a very useful tool. Uh, second, okay, Bill had a question. How do you sculpt forms and successfully turn them into solid bodies without res receiving the dreaded error messages about star points uh, and things like that? 
let me go back into to Fusion and I can kind of show you what that is about. And I keep clicking the wrong button here. All right. Let me create just a, a sculpt body like this. A very simple box we have right here. No problems with this. You see that, that it's all nice and pillowy as it normally is. But if I do something like edit form, let me maybe turn this like that and then go like that, right? This is going to have a big problem because there's a self intersection. We try to click finish form. It says it failed to convert. It won't display well. What do you want to do? So you usually say return edges or faces may be crossing review in box mode. What we have up here uh, handy is a display mode. You can go down here to display mode or it might be up here and you can switch this display mode to, I'm sure I'm getting all this, yep. Switch this display mode to box and sometimes that can really help you. You can also do kind of the box and the T-spline but sometimes box is nicer and you can kind of see, oh yeah, you know, there's some there's some issues here. You can also sometimes uh, change your visual style here. Um, no, not, not to wireframe, but uh, shaded with hidden edges. Sometimes that does it. You know, you might be able to play around there, but we'll just kind of keep this. Let's say that you sculpted this. You can go in and just uh, delete this. I'm going to kind of show you some ways of, of maybe uh, working with the star points and things like that. So I'm going to delete some of these and say, oh yeah, some of these are, are really, really not that good. Let me kind of delete some of these. That's still not going to convert. If we go and change the display mode to smooth, uh, we see a lot of errors right there. What I can do is I'm going to maybe click on edit form and uh, maybe move these up a little bit. Maybe move some of these in. You know, try to try to get this into a place that 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 might work. Now, I, I'm trying to kind of recreate some of these star points for you. So let me edit form and move this out a little bit. A uh, very cool tool is weld vertices. So I'm gonna go here and say I'm gonna weld this guy to this guy. It sucks it in. This guy to this guy. It gets into some issues right here, but maybe this to this, and we've hit a box. Now, there is a big issue with this, and an issue that is egregious enough that uh, it can't be a parametric shape at all, or it can't be a, a solid body at all. We go up here to repair body, we click on this, and we get a star point, right? This is an error star. We can uncheck all of these other ones except for error star and we see that there's an error right there. This means that you might need to do some work uh, to this to get this to uh, be right. You could do some subdivisions. You could also try the auto repair, right? So you click on auto repair and it just repaired the star point. It may not have repaired it properly, but at least this is something that could now, uh, is actually a valid type of model. If we try to click finish form, it's still going to have some problems, but the problems aren't invalid geometry. They're just some overlapping uh, parts of the geometry. So you can go in and let me do some edit forms and try to kind of figure out what might be around here. And we see that there's a hole right there. Kind of a good feature here. You go modify to fill hole and try to click on this. Uh, and then we get another issue. So we could do a, probably a collapse would work for that. And now this is a valid thing. If we click finish form, we're back out with a solid body. So error stars can be done. Uh, if we double click on this, uh, error stars can be fixed with the repair body command under utilities. It could be done in an automated way, or you can go and maybe do some deletions around it. If this were an error star, what I might wanna do is um, select all of these and do some subdivisions maybe. You know, you could do some exact subdivisions, try to subdivide it a little bit more to uh, 
to get some more kind of gradations inside of here to delete this. You can do all sorts of things, but that repair body is a very nice one to do. Bill had another question about 3D sketching. Let me show you that. Let me first go into preferences here, I believe. Yeah, you need to go into your preferences. Or actually, 3D sketching looks like it is now it is now, you know, just in part of Fusion. So this is great. We say create sketch. I'm going to create a sketch on this plane. I'm going to sketch a spline. Splines are very good for 3D sketches. Great. Just like I would normally rotate my model, I can click the view cube like that or rotate it. This is in three dimensions. It just happens to be drawn on two. With any of this, you can right click on a uh, on a sketch point and say move copy. But instead of moving it just in two directions, once you kind of rotate like this, you can see that there's a third direction. I can pop this guy up. I could click on this, move this guy down. And now as I rotate in three dimensions, you can kind of see it with the plane here. Let me actually stop my sketch and create a box on this plane just to kind of give you a reference point. There we go. You can see that this spline is indeed in three dimensions. I can do all sorts of things with this. I could create a pipe on this like that. I have a 3D pipe. Pretty awesome. It's just an edge after all, and you can use edges or you know sketch profiles and even edges or sketch profiles to do whatever you want. Some best practices with this, if we go back in here, if you click on these and say move, I'm going to move it up. That's great. But if I want to make this outwards, right? if I want to change the spline to be a different angle, and I click and I move on that, it doesn't work. Let me go here. If I click once on this, you'll see I have a nice green control bar. Great. I click on that. Oh, it just turned blue. I can't, I can't move it at all. I can't move it at all because now that this is a 3D spline, it doesn't know which direction I would be moving and clicking these because it's a three-dimensional spline and not a two-dimensional one. What you have to do with these is you have to right-click and say move copy or actually click on this. Uh, right-click on the part of the control handle you want and say move copy. It gives you move copy. You can now click on any of these. So I'm going to click on maybe this uh, bar, or actually click on that bar right there. I actually have to say I want to move this up. right? I'm moving this bar up. I want to move this bar over and like, like that. So I'm moving the bar in this direction. I'm moving the bar up in this direction. And I am totally changing the 3D profile of this. I could even click on this box and move it. And you see it does all sorts of weird things with that. But you have to use the, the actual move command. You can't just click anymore on the control handles of a spline and, and do that. If we were doing just a line, you can do the same thing. I'll do a line from here to here. Nice flat line. I can go on this. I can kind of click and drag just wherever I want this line to go, but it's always in two dimensions. I can click on this and say move, and now I can move this up. And you see that this is now a 3D line. If I try to click and drag on this, oh, I can't. I have to go and say move copy, uh, and then I can move this in very specific planes. It's one little step, but it's a needed step because you can't really move it properly in 3D without telling it which way to move. And you see our pipe has updated with all of that. Come back here and go like that. And let me go back to Bill's questions. Bill also asked if there's any way to apply constraints in all three axes. 
there is not. If you try to add a constraint on like collinear or uh, you know all of that, it, it doesn't really work. It kind of falls apart in 3D. If you look at the Fusion 360 Idea Station, there are a lot of requests for improvements to the 3D sketching environment. It's kind of basic right now. You can do lots of things. You can uh, kind of tie a 3D sketch point to a place on another object and all of that, but it, it is kind of rudimentary. It is what it is. Uh, I would go on to the idea station and vote for comments uh, on 3D sketching if you want it to be there, but you certainly can do it. You certainly can uh, kind of lock objects to other objects a little bit, but no real constraints for um, you know, quite a bit, unless you use kind of helper objects, right? You could have a 3D line that goes up with another line, and then that line is tied at the apex, and then as, you know, as long as the constraints aren't being broken, you can move things and those lines will move, but that's about it. That's all that, all that you can really do. Let me go to the next question. So this was a, a, a set of questions by, let me go down here. Oh yeah, An Anton. An uh, Anton DeWitt, this was some questions about uh, uh, using 3D scans inside of Fusion to do reverse engineering. Anton actually sent me some videos to SpaceClaim. Uh, SpaceClaim is uh, another type of solid modeling tool and its claim to fame, uh, claim to space fame, is, uh, well, it is a solid modeling tool. It's also really good at reverse engineering. If you ever look at Blender, at some of the re-topology tools that allow you to really easily kind of define a mesh that gets sucked down onto an object with nice quads that's all editable and movable, that is what Space Claim does for solid models. Space Claim costs a lot of money, right? You know, many thousands of dollars. Uh, so. It's not the best tool um, if you're looking to keep costs down. If you're looking to get retopology done very, very quickly, Space Clean is awesome. One other word with that, Blender can also do something like that. It's a totally different workflow, but you get to the same thing as you can actually spread out quads over meshes by snapping to it and then import those quads and convert those into uh, solid models, totally. Um, you have to use a separate tool for that. I can show you a little bit on how to do that with Fusion 360. It totally can be done and I can show you and I'm going to show you some best practices but it's a little bit painful because Fusion 360 is not specifically made for reverse engineering but you totally can do it. It's just not made for it. Tools that are made for it would be very very quick and are meant for professionals to just get it done. With Fusion, you can do it totally and you can work out some good workflows, but it's not gonna be as fast as a dedicated tool. Let me share my screen. I'll go back into Fusion right now. Uh, actually, for this, I will go into Mesh Mixer and bring in a bunny. Fix the bunny. I, I use this only because it is uh, somewhat detailed. There's some curves to this, but everybody has this bunny. If you have Mesh Mixer, then then you have the bunny for sure. Uh, what I could maybe do is bring in maybe a sphere or something, and you know, get a little thing on the bunny's back like this, and uh, Boolean union those together. That's a good little bunny. All right, export this as Bun Bun. All right. I'm going to go in here to insert insert mesh, and we'll select the bun bun like that. And then we got our bunny in here. If we wanted to convert this into quads, there would be a couple of ways to go. Uh, I, I talk about this actually in my mesh mixer and I think a little bit also in my fusion class how to do an actual conversion of this. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a shout out to that. If you export this as bunbun.obj, uh, this is actually just, you know, it only works with obj. Export it as an obj. And then if we go and that is not coming up easily, so let me go find it. There is a program out there called Instant Meshes, and I will start that right now. 
There we go, instant meshes. This is free open source software, runs on all platforms. And we open up the OBJ like this. Get our little bunny in here. Uh, we could say, you know, I want maybe 772, like, you know, I can do whatever vertexes I want. Uh, but let's say, fine, 772 is fine. Solve, solve. It's now in quads, export mesh as I only, only want quads and extract the mesh. Boom, it's now in quads. I save as bun bun quads.obj. Uh, for, for this, you actually have to say .obj, which is kind of weird, but it is what it is. And if I go back into Fusion now, let me just start a new design right here, and I insert this quads mesh, it comes in as a sculpt object. I can go in and uh, right click on this. I, I can't really convert it unless I turn off design history, which is, well, no, actually, let me, let me do this another way. Let me do this the proper way. If we go into the create form mode and we insert a mesh this way, Now we are in the create form mode. If we right click on this and say convert, we can say quad mesh to T-spline. It's now converted. We say finish form. Sometimes this works, sometimes it does it. In this case, it totally did work. This is now a full solid model. If you look inside of here, it's a full, it's a you know white little cylinder, a full on solid model. You'll be able to do anything you want with this. Sometimes it doesn't convert and you have to go into that repair tool and repair some star points. This is a converted model, um, you know, pretty darn accurate. If you can't do this or your model is too complex for Fusion to do, you have to do it the other way. The other way would be like this. You start off with a mesh like this. You go into create form. You say create face. Face is also gonna be up here like that. You want to start off when your first one was simple right here and four sides and then object snap. You can set whatever offset. I'm just going to maybe do a 0.3 millimeter offset, uh, but you could do a zero offset if you want. And I'm going to go and very roughly block out the, the different sides of this object. You see this is kind of yellow down here. That means that the next one is going to be connected to that. So I'm going to go, you know, maybe, oops. Yeah, I get kind of messed up sometimes um, with when that does, right there, like that. I created a big quad, so these points are 0.3 millimeter, but the, the face goes on the inside. What I'm trying to do is get the face close enough that it won't get, get sucked to another kind of side of the object. Now for the following ones, I'm going to click on Edge right here, and I can select this edge, go out, go out. And this is kind of like re-topo inside of uh, a lot of different tools, Blender, all of that. You have to kind of uh, have some strategy about how you do this. Like, I'm not sure where this would get sucked, so I'm going to try to maybe go right up here over the tail of the bunny. And again, I'm just trying to get it so that when I do a pull operation, the pull command works in kind of the, the, the proper direction. And you see I'm kind of getting into a little bit of trouble because I have lost track of the number of faces that are on this side. You could totally go here and create something like this that's too big and now you start to run into some trouble with, with creating like weird shapes of ones over here. I did that on purpose, you know, all of that. But you would go essentially go around the bunny with as big a, of faces as you could get that still would have a subdivision suck to the model. So what that means is I can go into the bodies here. Um, the, the mesh body, I can right click on this and make it maybe 10%. So it's just a little bit of a ghost. And at this point, like once I'm done creating this T-spline figure, I can actually right click on this mesh body and say selectable, unselectable. I don't need to select this body anymore. 
I just want to select these. So that's kind of a, a shortcut there. You see that this kind of works. It may not be perfect, but what I'm going to do is go in and say subdivide all of these. And you could say exact or simple, whatever you want. And I'm going to do it again. Subdivide again. All right, we have some good subdivisions. And now modify to pull. Again, I'm going to select all of them. So what these should do is they should pull out to the closest place on uh, the nearest object, which would be the mesh. Looked OK for right now. So now we're going to go in. These are a little bit pinched right here, but they did go onto the surface of the bunny. What you can do is when you say edit form, you can move this you know, edge or a point if you want, and you say object snap. If any of these snap to the wrong place, you can start to move them, and these are actually moving over the surface of the bunny right now when you click on object snap. Click on these. I'm kind of stretching them out. That's a little bit pinched right there. Maybe move this guy down. All of these are objects snapping right now because snap is turned on. I can bring these down if I want. If I hold down the Alt, okay, let me show you a little bit better. <clears throat> if I hold down the Alt key, I am still snapping, right? In this case, it actually went to the bottom of the bunny, which isn't maybe the best thing. That's all right. I'm still in the move operation. So I can go like this and try to get look at the bottom of the bunny like that. And I'm still snapping. So now I have snapped right to the bottom of the bunny. So you see that this guy has snapped pretty darn close. You can also, you know, I created these originally as just kind of the broad brush ones. But you can totally double click on like an edge like this and uh, go to Edit Form. Make sure that Object Snapping is on and Alt click. So I'm going to Alt click and I am still snapping these guys to the bunny. And you see it started to kind of curve around. When you do this snap direction, you can say to World or View Space, that is like this. So if you say world space, that is left and right to the world or to the view, you can say, you know, based on where I'm looking, I want you to do the snapping. Something like this, I would just go and maybe move this move this edge over. I'm losing some detail. You can kind of see the edge or sorry, the face like this going inside and outside of the model. You see that this kind of color in the middle is the the NURB surface and the shaded part is the bunny. So I've lost some detail right there. If I go to modify and simple, I can actually say snap even in that command. And now you see that I am more matching. If I subdivide these with simple with object snap, now you can see that this is very, very accurate to the surface of the bunny makes it a little bit more complex to weld all these together. But you kind of get the idea. You can go around, especially with that Alt command. We go to Edit Form, double click on that edge, and Alt click. Oh, nope, Alt. There we go. You know, th this is this is not probably the best way, but you see that it's, it's kind of wrapping around the bunny. This guy has gotten a little bit off here, so I still have object snap on. And you kind of get the idea. I'm moving these back. You can do all sorts of other commands with this to kind of flatten these out and all of that. But it is for sure moving around the bunny. If we finish form, you can kind of see that that has wrapped around the bunny. Using, let me, let me go back here. Doop to doop. Using the Alt click with the extrude and object snap allows you to just kind of wrap around. And if you're pretty judicious with, you know, not doing it with a big, big plane, you can get very, very accurate results just Alt snapping around. Start off with a, a large one, subdivide it, snap it, and then maybe do some Alt around or, or a combination of that. Hopefully, uh, Anton, that answered your question about uh, some of the better workflows for that. Uh, okay, let's see other questions. So Anton had some other questions about 
uh, bringing like files into Fusion. 3D like meshes uh, can be brought in. I brought in very very large. I brought in a, a, a oh, how much was it? Thirty meg. Uh, uh, STL file, very, very large one. It came into Fusion just fine. It was a little bit slow, but that's totally fine. Um, if you're trying to do reverse engineering, you might want to do a reduction in your mesh down to the minimum that your end product would need, right? So if you're 3D printing, your XY resolution is only going to be maybe, uh, you know, 100 microns. Uh, you know, some or, or or even less than that, right? You don't need something that comes in with a scan of extreme detail because in your end technique, if you're doing um, you know cam machining or something like that, the scan actually might be more accurate than your end thing. So inside of Fusion or inside of Mesh Mixer, if you run like a Make Solid for for instance or a remesh, you can remesh to uh, you know a 0.1 resolution or something like that, right? You can you can kind of uh, feel pretty safe at reducing or remeshing your object match to your end production need. Um, yeah, so I think I think that was it. The the mesh environment inside of Fusion to answer Anton's other question is very rudimentary. Uh, you can do some things if you know Mesh Mixer, just kind of stay in Mesh Mixer and do it all inside of there. The only thing that's special about the mesh environment inside of Fusion is that you can do those mesh cross sections, which I talk about in my Fusion 360 class, where you can create cross sections of a mesh for objects where that's appropriate, and then loft between them, do all sorts of different you know objects or, or operations between them. That's a, a very useful thing. That kind of goes over what I had. If anybody has any questions who's uh, listening, I would be very happy to, to answer them. The other thing I wanted to bring up is, let me do a screen share again. I always forget to bring this up, but um, we are authors. Actually, if you just go to honeypoint3d.com, as you see right here, uh, we have a, a banner right here. Uh, we have the number one 3D printing book on Amazon. It's actually uh, number one and pretty high in Kindle sales as well. Uh, so it's it's very easy, number one bestseller, and actually 3D graphic design, which is the level above 3D printing. Five stars, uh, you know, only about $14, $15, something like that. And um, it's a really great intro if you want to learn about 3D printing or 3D modeling, 3D graphic design like this. Um, you know, we're, we're right number one, and we were somewhere in the top 15 for Kindle versions too, but I guess we've dropped off of that. But our, our physical book is, is doing very well on that. So just always a, a plug for the, for the book. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to email me. We do these webinars monthly, and I really appreciate uh, you taking the time for this webinar. We have classes online. We have engineering services come and uh, work with us. We're happy to, uh, to have you learn and everything. So have a great month, and I will be back in April with another webinar. Thanks so much. Bye.